Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, July 15th, 2021, and today we're going to be talking about the House Republicans raising a lot of money, coinciding with the Senate Republicans raising, can you guess it, a lot of money ahead of 2022. When you're looking at the Senate election results from 2020 and the House election results, one thing you might notice is that the House election, Senate elections were extremely close, as was the presidential level. Now, while Democrats do have a trifecta, which they can certainly use to leverage things such as budget reconciliation or monumental, monumental passes in the House of Representatives, but not necessarily in the United States Senate, the GOP is just trying to reclaim at least one portion of the government besides the Supreme Court, where they have an ideological majority, but really is only in effect once a bill or law is actually challenged and brought all the way up there. So right now, I will say that the GOP is in a position where they are largely ineffective in United States Congress. While they do have the ability to uh, put forth the filibuster and take advantage of that, so do Democrats the next time they are in the minority. But right now, currently speaking, the GOP would much rather be in a position where they have the majority in one chamber, effectively stopping all discussion about abolishing the filibuster, budget reconciliation, and other types of measures that are taken in the House and the Senate to subvert the otherwise difficult way of passing bills through the traditional standard. Now, these new fundraising uh, methods and goals by the Republican Party have proven to be beneficial. We have now found out that the House Republicans have raised the most money they've ever raised in an off year in their second quarter, fundraising raising $45.4 million in the last three months. Understand where we are. At this point in time, 2021 should be the most boring time of the election season. The midterm elections are a year and a half away. The general election is three and a half years away. So there isn't exactly much right around the corner. When 2018 happened, we were right into the presidential election. People were announcing not even a month later. But for right now, we don't know who's running for president in 2024. And for many races in 2022, we don't have the strongest or the most notable people announcing their campaigns yet. So looking at this amount of money raised by the GOP in comparison to what the Democrats have raised, it shows a stark comparison. The Democrats raised nearly $10 million less than the GOP in the House of Representatives. And this comes as a result, largely, I think, due to the fact that Democrats retained control of the House in 2020. When Democrats were able to do this, they sort of made their voters, in a sense, complacent that a trifecta would be underway. And while many major things were discussed and prioritized if Democrats were to reclaim the majority, realistically speaking, much of it can't happen without abolishing the filibuster. Democrats sending out the COVID-19 stimulus checks, okay, that was done through budget reconciliation. The Democrats have just now agreed on a $3.5 trillion bill through budget reconciliation, but other than that, there isn't much else the Democrats can do with this majority, especially in the House of Representatives. So with the House of Representatives largely in a position where they were in 2018, where they will pass something, it'll go to the Senate and die through a filibuster or die through just not enough votes from Democrats or Republicans, it makes the House seem stagnant, that they aren't getting much done. And I can see why Republicans would be able to hone in on that and raise money that way. You see, when the when Donald Trump lost the presidential election in 2020, the Republicans knew that the midterm elections would be their first opportunity to make major inroads against the Democratic Party. And none other more popular method to defy the president than the United States House of Representatives. I mean, taking a look at the 2010 midterm elections, despite the Democrats winning over 250 seats in 2008, by 2010, by the time that election had concluded, the GOP had flipped 60 three seats, one of the largest electoral pickups in terms of congressional districts in a midterm election or presidential election, one of the largest in United States history. <clears throat> so when Democrats look at 2010, they are alarmed. When the GOP looks at it, they look at it as one of their most shining, shining nights of the 21st century. When they see that plus 63 gain on the side of the New York Times, I mean, you're talking about a monumental victory. If you look at 2020, you don't see plus 63. What you see is plus 12. The GOP picked up 12 seats from the Democratic Party, which was a very good showing for them, considering that typically speaking, presidential elections don't do well for Republicans in the House of Representatives. This time, it did. And looking at the fundraising numbers, not only in the House, but also in the Senate, 
you also start to see some pretty good responses. You'll see here that Republicans raked in $10.5 million in June in the United States Senate and $28 million in the second quarter of 2021. A reason why I think that this is also very impressive is considering this sheer narrow amount of swing states on the Republican side and on the Democratic side, which means that much more money can go to much more races. You see, if we take a look at the 2020 uh, Senate elections, you'll see that both Georgia seats were competitive. You had North Carolina, which was competitive. You had Michigan, which was competitive. You had Minnesota, which was competitive. You had Colorado. You had New Mexico, you had Arizona, you had Montana, right? You had Maine. We're already at 10 states that were deemed competitive. And if you add in the states that were in the likely column, not the safe column, Virginia, Iowa, Kansas, Texas, Alaska, where does that put you? 15 states that were decided by less than a safe margin. More swing states, more less than safe, at least more competitive to an extent states than there were safe states. But 2022 doesn't seem to be in a very similar position. I mean, you can count how many swing states there are based off of the current estimations. Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, Iowa, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and New Hampshire. Yes, it's 11, but understand that the GOP will be allocating a lot of this money towards races such as Pennsylvania, where they have an incumbent, Wisconsin, where they have an incumbent, North Carolina, where they have an incumbent. And while they are retiring in Pennsylvania and North Carolina and potentially in Wisconsin, they still have that residual support from 2016. In addition, when you're talking about states such as these 11, the GOP probably is only going to funnel a lot of this money towards the prime few that are truly deemed competitive. I think that their own political pundits will start to realize that states such as Colorado might be a waste of money. Or if Chuck Grassley or Pat Grassley is the nominee in the state of Iowa, then it won't need to be as focused on as if either of the two weren't running. Which means that the money not only narrows down from all the congressional districts, you know, what we're going to be looking at with the House uh, Republican uh, chair spending $45.4 million over maybe 30, 40, 50 swing districts. What you're going to be looking at here is $28 million from the second quarter, counting up however much money is raised on the GOP side, continuing on, spread across four or five states. And that's why these fundraising numbers are very positive. You know, when you see the United States Senate, which and some people would say is more of um, an, an at-risk type of, not necessarily at risk for the Democrats, but more of a slippery slope, I would say, for the Democratic Party, because if they lose the United States Senate, I mean, it's not as if they're going to be able to easily take it back two years later. In the House of Representatives, it could, technically speaking, flip back and forth between Democrats, Republicans, Democrats, Republicans, because every single seat is up for re-election every single two years, uh, every two years. In the United States Senate, the people elected in 2022, the next time they are up, get this, in 2028. There are six-year terms in the United States Senate, which puts the Democratic Party in a poor position because of the 2024 map uh, that really sh says, you know, if they lose the Senate in 2022, their next time potentially winning back the United States Senate will probably be 2026 or potentially this Senate map again in 2028, considering that this Senate map is one of the best Senate maps the Democratic Party has seen in quite some time. But for the House of Representatives, you know, there's a, I would say, uh, a quicker opportunity for Democrats to win, but we haven't seen the newly drawn map, which is also something that really would be alarming. If I was on the Democratic campaign and I was looking at these fundraising numbers by the House Republicans versus the House Democrats, I mean, it is a big difference here. Nearly uh, a third of the Democratic Congressional Committee uh, campaign's money is, you know, that's how much in surplus the GOP has over the Democratic Party. So, what you would expect from the Democrats is that they would use this as a way, as a fundraising effort, as a sort of a marketing ploy to get more money from their donors, more money from their constituents. Um, but they really should have been harping on, in on this notion that the congressional districts would be drawn in such an unfortunate fashion, uh, you know, declaring to their voters that 2022 will be a red wave. And it seems while they've had that ammunition to use against the GOP, it isn't bringing as much money as the party that is currently in the opposition. And the reason why this is also, again, alarming is when you take a look, I don't have it in front of me, but I implore you to go onto the 538 website, take a look 
at the Joe Biden approval rating. If Joe Biden is approved of by 9, 10 points nationwide, and yet House Republicans are still breaking records in terms of fundraising, can you imagine what happens when Biden eventually, because it is inevitable for every presidency in presidential history, that you become unpopular at some point? If they are raising, they being the GOP, if they are raising a lot of money now, can you imagine how much they would raise or will raise once Joe Biden becomes that unpopular president the same way Obama was. And then you start considering 2010, 2014. I don't think I have to remind many of you guys because you lived through it. But if you weren't there, let me go ahead and show you because it was a very poor showing for the Democratic Party in the United States Senate in 2014 and the United States House in both 2010 and 2014. It's the equivalent of the 2018 for the Democrats, but this time for the Republicans. I'm not going to show you 2010. Just know that it was a 63-seat gain for the GOP. But in 2014, the Republicans took their highest uh, House majority in the entirety of the 21st century. For reference, the Democrats had their highest majority in 2008. Two years later, they lost it. But in 2014, the Republicans won 247 seats to the Democrats' 188. The amount of seats that the GOP held was much higher. And, you know, despite 2012, them losing the popular vote in the House of Representatives because of gerrymandering, Republicans were able to retain control by a lot. In 2014, they were able to expand it. And you can see it's a sea of red, only small pockets of blue, with exceptions being Minnesota and the Northeast and maybe Arizona. But other than that, the states themselves were predominantly Republican. Some of them didn't even have a single Democratic representative, even disregarding states with one district seats. So looking at 2014, this is what the Democratic Party wants to prevent. But that was the direct result of Barack Obama being unpopular. 2022 is what they want to prevent from being a repeat of 2014 or 2010. Because 2022 is a year where we are recovering from COVID-19. Our economy is going to be back to where it used to be, at least hopefully speaking. So looking at the House of Representative elections in 2022, there are opportunities for Democrats to try to use a very unforeseen circumstance for the election to try to ride 2022 into a year that may not be a wave for Democrats, but try to treat it as if or make it as if it is some type of okay year for them not where they're blown out like 2010 or 2014 maybe just a year such as 2012 where they win the house of representatives popular vote lose the majority because they are going to lose it by redistricting as it stands and as it looks currently but we don't have the final map so you know we still have to wait on that but looking at the house itself democrats might need to gear up for a potential year where yes they will lose the majority in the house but it won't be as bad but right now, the GOP doesn't seem to be uh, stepping their foot off the pedal. They are raising money at a rate that you would expect if Joe Biden was widely unpopular. But the thing is, he just simply is not. $45.4 million in three months. That is extremely high. It says that it's their record quarterly haul during a year without a national election. They said that they raised $20 million alone in June. The Democrats raised just $14 million in June and brought their total to 36.5. While the Democrats do have a lot of money, the Democrats don't have more than the GOP. In 2020 and 2018, they had a significant fundraising advantage at this point in time. Republicans did eventually catch up to be around even in 2020, with Democrats narrowly ahead in either the Senate or Congressional Committee. But in 2018, the Democrats certainly were running ahead of the GOP. This is the exact opposite of what happened in 2018. But the point being that if the opposite of what happened in 2018 happens now, the Republicans will, re will be able to regain control of the United States House of Representatives. So fundraising numbers sometimes can be skewed, aren't always the most accurate indicator, but around 90% of the time, the candidate who raises more money than their opponent wins the election. And the same can be applied in many cases to the House majority and also the Senate majority. Keep in mind the fundraising numbers, they hold a lot of interesting information. They're not 100% accurate. They're not entirely declarative, especially at this point ahead of 2022, but they do provide more context and do provide a bit of a warning sign 
for Democrats considering how much money, just the sheer amount of money that the Democrats are, the Republicans are fundraising ahead of 2022, considering that there is so much at stake for Democrats, they really need to keep their eyes peeled and keep a very strong focus on the GOP for this upcoming midterms. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 midterm election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.